This is Epicenter episode 399 with guest Felix Leupold. Welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Brian Fogman Crane, and I'm here with Sonny Agarwal. So today we're going to speak with Felix Leupold. He is a software engineer at Gnosis. He's working there on a project called CowSwap. And Gnosis has done a lot of very innovative work around AMMs, decentralized exchanges. There's been various iterations and CowSwap is kind of the latest of those. So we're going to speak about that, speak about AMMs more generally. But before we get to the episode, we'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about some of our sponsors. So one of our first sponsors for this week is Solana. So Solana is a next generation blockchain with lightning fast blocks and fees that are less than a cent per transaction right now. Scalability is one of the biggest challenges facing crypto, obviously. And you know, Solana, I think, is one of the best when it comes to really solving scalability by tackling the throughput that a single blockchain can tackle. And they've done this through a number of really interesting innovations. So go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. And this episode is also brought to you by Exodus. So Exodus is an easy to use wallet that supports hundreds of different crypto assets. It has native applications for like all the platforms, including iOS, Android, desktop app. And it's a fully non-custodial wallet. So, uh, you know, you can keep your keys and that's very much at the core of their philosophy. They've been around for a very long time, used a lot. You can also directly swap different coins uh, from within Exodus. So go check it out, go give Exodus a try. So it's at exodus.com. And with that, let's get into the episode. So Felix, thank you so much for joining us today. Maybe just tell us a little bit, like what is, has your personal journey into uh, blockchain been and how did you end up working uh, at Gnosis and on uh, CowSwap? It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I joined Gnosis as a software engineer about about three years ago, uh, and I kind of directly started working on uh, decentralized exchange protocols within Gnosis. Um, before I'd been following the Ethereum ecosystem for uh, a couple of years, I, I was at uh, DEF CON 0, where actually, or it was DEF CON 1 in, in London, where there was a very inspiring talk for the project that we are now working on, on batch auctions to be used in, in blockchains actually there. But then yeah, I was working as a software engineer at Facebook at the time, working on end-to-end -end encryption and privacy, so always kind of interested in cryptography. And then, yeah, about three years ago, I took the leap and, and joined Gnosis. And since then, we've been working on, well, applying batch auctions to as, an, as a trading mechanism to uh, the decentralized exchange landscape. And, and that's what CowSwap, our latest product, uh, is doing in a kind of meme-y and, uh, and fun, fun way. You know, I, I had this joke that I used to make a, a year ago where Gnosis is building all the fundamental infrastructure of Ethereum except for prediction markets. Uh, so I mean, obviously <laughs> since then, I think you guys actually did have released some uh, prediction market projects, uh, products with, you know, like you had the, it's called open. So tell me about like Gnosis, you know, especially for like a lot of the longtime listeners of the podcast, you know, last time we had Martin, well, last time we had Martin on was actually for circles, but you know, the previous time was about, you know, still about prediction markets. And so it seems to me that like Gnosis has taken this big shift away from the prediction markets and working on every other important piece of infrastructure for Ethereum. So can you tell us a little bit about how did that, why did that happen? Yeah. So um, one thing that is maybe not super intuitive is that decentralized exchange mechanisms are a fundamental part of actually bringing prediction markets, efficient prediction markets onto the blockchain. And so in a way, like how I would see it is that Gnosis has actually, is actually done implementing the you know, basic prediction market contract where you have positions that um, then at some point when the unknown event in the future can be resolved, um, perform a payout to whoever holds the outcome token that um, well, happens to represent the correct event. But then there's kind of two uh, hard parts in prediction markets. And one of them is the Oracle problem, which at Gnosis, we've always taken a quite agnostic approach um, towards. We said kind of, well, you can plug in any Oracle that you'd like in our prediction market um, smart contract framework. 
So really, like it's up to you what you would like to use as an as an oracle. And then we've traditionally kind of focused more on the second hard problem for prediction markets, which is actually making these outcome tokens liquid and tradable before the event happens, before the certainty has arrived. And well, you can just redeem them in the underlying smart contract. And this is where where I would say um, Gnosis Protocol, or today the application on top of Gnosis Protocol um, called CowSwap, started because in prediction markets, you tend to have very fragmented um, or illiquid tokens. Um, and so having a traditional kind of classic continuous limit order book is usually, well, it's, it's, it's very tough to get a, to get a dense or to get a, to get a good bid ask spread for events that maybe not a lot of people care about, like your local uh, soccer league or something, something like that. And so when thinking about prediction markets and how to bring that to kind of mass adoption, we also had to think about, well, effective trading mechanisms. And um, that's where kind of our idea of batch auctions or in general, discrete, discrete time mechanisms um, started. So, you know, you guys iterated over a series of many different types of decentralized exchanges. Like you guys worked on like a lot of batch auction systems. You had this Gnosis protocol. I feel like maybe CowSwap is one of the first times when you guys are really diving into AMMs specifically, or, you know, maybe that's the first time, you know, because you guys were one of the first ones to ever come up with AMMs back like four or five years ago. Why this return to like focused on AMM based infrastructure, or DEX infrastructure? So what we've realized with Gnosis Protocol version one, which we launched um, about a little bit more than a year ago, it was in April, April 2020, was that with kind of a a closed system or kind of in, well, yeah, we, with this the Gnosis Protocol V1, we were not open to tap into any of the other uh, kind of on-chain liquidity sources that there are. So one fundamental thing about batch auctions is that they are kind of a method like or they're kind of a, a mechanism that is that is not open necessarily to the public so it, it's well it's okay let me let me rephrase it actually um, so so one thing about batch auctions is that it requires a certain auctioneer or some form of in our system it's called solver to actually settle the auction on chain and so while um, this auctioneer could theoretically tap into um, any of the on-chain liquidity sources it's not like uh, Uniswap, for example, where any other protocol can tap into that specific liquidity source. So for um, yeah, Gnosis Protocol, it's not that the orders that are placed as part of our batch auction are publicly available um, on like this atomic liquidity pool um, and can be tapped in by anyone. Maybe just to take a little bit of a step back, and can you explain on like on a high level, like what are the different attempts that Gnosis has made in creating decentralized exchanges and what are the key, you know, learnings you've had of things of like, oh, this is really working or this is like not the right way to go? Yeah, for sure. So the, the very first auction mechanism that we've built was probably for our own token sale back in 2017, uh, where instead of doing an English auction or a fixed price token sale, we went with a Dutch auction. Um, because even at that time, kind of Martin, uh, the CEO, and Stefan, they kind of foresee this problem, foresaw this problem of um, front running. And basically, when there is a good that everyone wants, and basically a, a price that is increasing uh, over time, it well basically is is an is a mechanism that is that is prone to whoever has the best kind of mechanism, well, the best hardware, the best uh, algorithm to. To, to get in as fast as possible. And so for the Gnosis token sale, what they wanted to do is actually have a descending auction. So they started at a very high uh, price per token that was decreasing as a function of time. And that mechanism is called a Dutch auction, which worked extremely well for the GNO token sale. And so one of the ideas was, even though um, we were already thinking about batch auctions at the time, well, let's just implement Dutch auctions um, as a product and, and give other people access to use this kind of auction because it has been working so well for our, for our use case. And so we've built um, Dutch X uh, as a product and we kind of thought, well, this might take three to six months. And so it's a nice interim step, the first product to launch. It turned out to take much longer, um, much more than a year, I think. And yeah, kind of the problem that we saw that when when applying Dutch auctions kind of on regular trading is that people are not comfortable with kind of these long um, wait times. So in Dutch X, I think an auction was running up to 12 hours. It was expected to clear within six hours. 
and people just are not really uh, really not comfortable to you know start a trade at you know some point in time but only know that their trade will be executed at a certain price a couple of hours later and the other thing that was really hard about dutch auctions was the um, concept of teaching people that the price you would be getting is a function of the time and not a function of what you're actually you know of, of a bid or something that you're putting in at the moment um, and that concept was was really just hard for people to 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 grasp and understand um, and so other market mechanisms that were more direct where you actually could execute a swap directly and once your transaction is mined you have your you have your tokens and you can can use them freely um, got an got an edge over um, over over Dutch X. and so from there on we then um, circled back and said well we had this more general idea for how trading on the blockchain could become more fair and less um, front running prone um, and yeah, just that would be within a single Ethereum block there should never be two assets traded in two separate transactions with a different price because well blockchains are inherently discrete uh, in terms of every 12-15 seconds we get a new block and then all the information in that block is kind of happening at the very same instant in the very same millisecond nanosecond if you wish and so having these price time priority mechanisms on chain like Uniswap for example uh, seemed problematic to us um, at the time and so we started looking into batch auction with uniform clearing prices just briefly you, you call it a price time priority mechanism can you explain that yeah so um, the maybe in layman's term would be first come first served uh, but basically that even within a single block the ordering in which your transactions are executed matter because the underlying mechanism uses some state within the system so in uh, uniswap amms it would be the reserve values uh, to give you a price and so if somebody trades uh, the first index of a block they see the current reserve value and they change them with their trade and so whoever gets second will get a slightly or sometimes significantly different price um, and that kind of opens the the door to these to these games that are being played uh, on the on ethereum today with with maximally extractable value where if you have a trade that would um, affect uh, Uniswap AMM significantly and you actually are, you, you happen to set a, a high slippage tolerance, so you're actually okay with receiving a significantly worse price, what somebody can do is they can just try to get right in front of you to move the current AMM price all the way down to your reserve, to your limit price. Then your transaction will go through at the at your pain point, basically at the at the last price that you're willing to accept, and then that other person uh, could just reverse their own trade. And well, because they initially bought at a low price, you traded, so you raised the price. They are now selling at a high price, and uh, buying low, sell high is, is, a, is yeah, it's usually a good strategy. And yeah, that's kind of what I mean by by price time priority. Now let's talk about Solana. We all know that scalability is one of the most important issues facing the blockchain industry today. The Solana blockchain has been engineered from the ground up, optimizing for performance and scalability. The network supports thousands of transactions a second with 600 millisecond block times and over 500 different validators. It's not a sharded blockchain, but a single blockchain hyper-optimized for performance. And that makes it easy to maintain composability between the apps on Solana so they work together seamlessly. The Solana ecosystem is growing at a rapid pace, and it's a great place to build your project and get involved with the community. So go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. So you mentioned DutchX, right? I remember the launch. I think we actually also did an episode at the time on, on Epicenter about that. Now DutchX didn't really like get the traction. Uh, of course, it makes a lot of sense, right? That the user experience is just like, it's not what people are used to, right? To put in trade and then wait six hours or wait 12 hours and they don't know what happens and is it going to clear or not. Where does Gnosis Protocol and then CowSwap come in and maybe also like what's the relationship between Gnosis Protocol and CowSwap? So Gnosis Protocol in its first version was cutting down the expected trading time from six hours to five minutes. Um, so we would collect orders over the course of a five minute period, which we could would call a batch. And then we would settle it, we would settle all the orders that we had received in that batch um, at a uniform clearing price. Now, um, and that's kind of what I tried to say earlier um, with this idea of being closed is that all the orders that are 
submitted into a single batch can basically could in version one only be settled against one and another. We had no access to kind of any any other on-chain liquidity. And what I would say is now kind of the breakthrough mechanism in Gnosis Protocol version two is that in the settlement, we can trade orders against one another, kind of peer-to-peer if you wish. But we can also take whatever we cannot settle within a single batch and what we sometimes refer to as the excess amounts and settle those excess amounts against any on-chain liquidity that we can find, which allows us to significantly reduce the batch sizes. So before we said, well, we need to wait at least five minutes to have enough trades in one batch that, that, that we can make a settlement, that actually something can happen. But now, because we can basically, if there's no overlap in in trade intents, we can still just go and settle with the best on-chain liquidity, we can cut batches much, much shorter. And so at the moment, we are waiting for 30 seconds um, to collect user orders. But theoretically, we could cut this down and actually have a single batch per block. And by this, hopefully at some point, ensure that people that are trading in the same block will get cleared at a, at a uniform clearing price. And then, yeah, the question was about the relationship with CowSwap and Gnosis Protocol. Um, so the I would say the trading mechanism uh, using batch auctions with uniform clearing prices, that is kind of the core value p- proposition and the core idea of Gnosis Protocol, so the, the trading mechanism in itself. And then CowSwap is um, our first application built on top of that protocol. So it's our first trading user interface that we've built. And we've taken a lot of um, inspiration and even some of the front-end code from Uniswap version 2 uh, just to make it a very playful and very um, easy to use experience um, because that was also something we learned from Gnosis Protocol v1 is that um, well people were not getting the hang of our uh, user experience and so kind of for v2 we thought let's start at the exact opposite let's take something that works that everybody understands and let's try to make the minimum amount of changes to it to make it work with uh, a new DEX mechanism. Um, and so this is what CowSwap basically is, uh, playful and memeful. So when you say CowSwap, you're referring specifically to sort of the front end portion of it and the actual sort of batching algorithm and everything that would fall under your classification of the Gnosis protocol now. Right. So Gnosis Protocol works um, basically with um, off-chain signatures, which are just expressing uh, intents to trade for for the people that are using it. And CowSwap is just one source for these intents to trade. So if you if you create an order on CowSwap, you're actually not creating an Ethereum mainnet transaction, but you're actually just signing a message with your private key, and then that message is handed over to Gnosis Protocol which allows these so-called solvers that perform the settlement on your behalf to then enforce things that the protocol wants, for example, uniform clearing prices, um, aggregating orders together. Um, But theoretically, these orders could come from any front end. They could be coming from DEX aggregators. They could be coming from MetaMask directly, from balancers, front end. Like We are really agnostic um, for the source of these intents to trade. So maybe we should start to dive into a little bit about, I mean, so, so this whole cow meme, like, you know, it, it, it's an acronym uh, for coincidence of wants. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what is this entire concept and what, what, what is CowSwap really trying to solve here with this coincidence of wants? So while we think that these kind of concept of having batch auctions with uniform clearing prices is our long-term vision for how trading should happen on, on, on Ethereum, one thing that to us is a very clear use case or a very clear argument why this is actually a better mechanism is that today two people trade the same asset in opposite directions. So let's say I am trying to buy ETH for USDC and you're um, trying to sell ETH for USDC. Then we would both be trading against, let's say, the most liquid AMM on chain. In the very extreme case, we would be even maybe trading roughly the same amounts. So the price of the two assets we are trading would not even change uh, because you're just moving the AMM up slightly and I'm moving the AMM down slightly. But at the end of the block, the AMM hasn't changed, but it has still generated fees for whoever provided liquidity for it. So in in some sense, the AMM acts like a sponge on chain, like an intra-block sponge um, that is not really needed because if we meet in the same block at the same time, we could just trade directly against one another. I give you my ETH, you get, you know, I get your USDC, and we just basically trade OTC or um, well, peer-to-peer, if you wish. And so this this phenomenon, when two parties um, want the exact 
opposite of one another. I want exactly what you are trying to sell and you want exactly what I'm trying to sell. That is what is called coincidence of wants in the literature. And so coincidence of wants short is a cow. And, you know, we are looking for something that is easy to to build a community or build a meme around. And so, yeah, cow swap uh, seemed like a very good, very good candidate for this. So can can you explain how CowSwap works from a user perspective? So you said that you're you know you're not tra- trading directly on chain, right? Not creating an on-chain transaction, but you're kind of like delegating. You're signing a message and sort of delegating this trade execution. So like, h- how does that work? Right. So the the first thing that we need to get users to do is instead of um, kind of signing their own. Ethereum transactions and and executing the trades by themselves um, in a single transaction on chain, uh, we need to actually get them. So if we want to be able to batch them together and create these cows, we need to get users to pass on this right to settle the transaction on chain to a third party. And in the context of MEV or um, well, this maximal extractable value, this actually makes a lot of sense because if you give the miner your transaction directly today, they are most likely going to try to extract as much value from that transaction as possible um, because, well, they have no incentive to act in your best interest. Uh, You're assigning them a transaction, you're giving them a transaction fee, and they can artificially order that transaction in the block as they they would like. And so from a user perspective, it actually makes a lot of sense to think about, well, who should, like, giving your transaction to a a third party that can protect you from minor extractable value in and of itself is, is something that uh, we see more and more people doing with the adoption of MEV geth and flashbots. Um, and this is also kind of a prerequisite that we need to even implement batch auctions. And so, and so this is kind of the high level idea on, on CowSwap is that when you go and click, click the swap button, you won't actually see a MetaMask pop up with a transaction, but you'll just see some message um, that you're signing, which basically says, I'm willing to trade this token for that token at a specific limit price. And there's also a deadline uh, involved, like up until when this trade is valid. And then this kind of intent to trade is being sent to our backend, which collects all the orders that are happening kind of roughly at the same time. And then about every 30 seconds, we have one of these passes that or one of these runs that we call a solver run, where a bunch of independent algorithms or even well, at the moment, they are mostly run by us, but eventually they should be decentralized and run also by different parties. Um, but a bunch of different solvers look at the um, intents that have been submitted to the back end, basically listing what do people want to trade at the moment. And then they're trying to find the best possible way of matching those. Um, and of course, first they will, they will check, can I match subsets of uh, these trades directly with one another? Because in that case, I can save AMM fees, I can save private market maker fees, I can just make the most effective trade directly peer to peer. And then they will check kind of whatever is left um, and look at all the on chain liquidity that is available and try to find the best path for kind of the leftover, the excess um, to settle that using the best dex aggregator or using a portion of it with balancer, a portion of it with curve. Kind of um, theoretically, the protocol is completely agnostic to, to the underlying liquidity that is being used. Then all these solvers kind of come to a come to a result like this is my proposed solution and then we have a ranking in place that compares the different solutions in terms of which solution serves the user best and that serves the user best is um, something that we can go into in a little bit more detail but just kind of to come to an end here um, the the solver that provides the best solution uh, based on the criterion is then eligible to actually send this transaction on chain um, and because it's a third party it's a professional entity that that on chain submission is also done the user is much better protected from mev uh, by that professional solution submission because it can use things like mev get or flash flashbots directly it can watch the mempool for race conditions and see oh now my solution is no longer valid or um, i need to reorder the mempool in this way so um, that the solution can go through and it can also set very tight slippage bounds on the underlying protocols that it uses even in and of itself, even if you're just trading by yourself, a professional solver will likely protect you much better from MEV than you could um, with your with your MetaMask extension. I think that's a very interesting piece to dive into of like, you know, this ranking. What is the utility function that these solver are trying to optimize over? What is, is it to minimize the fees that users will have to pay? Is it to 
decrease the slippage that users have to pay. And, and when you say like, you know, what's best for the users, I mean, the hard part is here we have a multi-party system and what's good for some users might be bad for other users. So how, how, how does the solvers take these into account? Right. Um, and, and just to maybe um, pre prefix this, uh, we don't necessarily, we are not confident that we found the very best solution to this yet. And this is ongoing kind of discussion and work in progress. And I'm super happy to talk about our thought process. Um, but if somebody has great ideas on how to improve this, we're we're definitely still still also researching this and working with also yeah, known researchers on on this topic. But um, so basically, the idea is that whenever you have batch auctions, so whenever you kind of go away from this traditional continuous limit order book, you stop having kind of these traditional graphs. If you've seen a limit order book, you've probably seen uh, this this graph that kind of diverges, almost kisses each other in the middle. You have the bid curve and the ask curve. And then in the middle, there's a little gap. Hopefully, it's very tiny. And that is your bid ask spread. But they will never overlap. Because the moment that something would overlap in a continuous limit order book, it would just execute right away and, and the overlap would be gone. However, in batch auctions, because you're collecting orders over time, you might have the the situation where somebody is willing to sell a certain good at a very low price, but somebody else is willing to buy it at a very high price. And so you have this overlap and kind of willingnesses to pay. And the question is, how do you how do you find the, the clearing price in this overlap that is the fairest? Uh, and the first kind of metric that, that we define is what we call the trader surplus. And the trader surplus is basically the difference between the limit order that you placed. So let's say you were willing to buy one ETH at $2,000. And then the price you ended up getting eventually. So let's say you, you, this, our solver decided, well, the price of ETH is $1,900 in this batch. So you actually get to buy your one ETH at $1,900. And so your surplus is the difference between your limit price and the price that um, you actually got. So in this case, it would be $100. That, that would be your individual trader surplus. And now kind of the basic idea was, well, let's just maximize trader surplus over all orders. And let's try to just find the globally maximal trader surplus. And that's also kind of what we did in Gnosis Protocol V1. One issue with that is that um, you can actually lie about your surplus in certain ways. Um, so you can say, this is my limit price and uh, you set your limit price very low and so you can boost your surplus in some ways. And then if you combine this with maybe some tokens that are particularly illiquid or where you control all the liquidity, some token that you created, for example, there are actually ways in which you can manipulate this, this mechanism and, and, and boost your individual trader surplus to make the, the best solution choose a path that, that favors you over other people. And so for Gnosis Protocol V2, what we implemented was a mechanism that also says, well, whatever prices the, the solver proposes, um, there has to be, and that's a concept called envy freeness. Um, there has to be basically, if, if, I, if I decide ETH is trading at 1900 and you had your order and you were willing to buy it at 2000, then it means that I cannot leave your order, your order out of the system. Um, it means I have to trade your order because your limit price was actually above the clearing price. And if I told you you're not getting matched, you would say like, but why? I had a, I had a price that was actually higher. And so you would be jealous or you would have envy. And so the, the concept of envy freeness, meaning that if we select a price that is better than your limit order, we, we also have to match you. Um, and this kind of ensures that even with fake tokens, um, I can maybe lie about my personal utility, but I cannot manipulate uh, batches in a way that I would basically make you not trade um, eventually. Let's get to our sponsor, Exodus. Exodus is a fantastic cryptocurrency wallet that strikes the right balance between ease of use, security, and great features. You can get Exodus on the iPhone, desktop app, web app, Android, whatever platform you use. It's a non-custodial wallet, and that is so critical. Because what's the point of crypto if you don't control your own assets? With Exodus, you always do. They're old school and they've been around since 2015. Over 1.2 million users rely on Exodus, so you know that they've stood the test of time. They have support for over 100 different crypto assets. And from within Exodus, you can easily exchange one different asset to the other. They also allow you to buy crypto with fiat. And they even have a great offer where you can buy up to $500 worth of crypto through their iOS app and pay just $1 in fee. So go to exodus.com slash epicenter and check out their wallet. We want to thank Exodus for their amazing support of Epicenter. 
with these solvers, are there some kind of economic incentives around providing solutions? And do you think that a market is going to emerge around this? We very much hope so. Uh, at the moment, our intention, so basically, uh, yes, there is an economic incentive and kind of at least probably at the high level, we will just charge one fee for orders. And that is kind of what um, solvers will be paid uh, from, but just kind of on a theoretically level, how this fee should be chosen. Because solvers perform the actual transaction submission for you, they need to pay gas or an, maybe get the minor bribe on your behalf. So they actually have a cost for settling your transactions. And so we at least need to give them back kind of what you would have paid if you had settled your uh, trade by yourself as a as a high level Ethereum transaction. And then on top of that, we think that we can um, charge a small, very small percentage as kind of a protocol fee. And we are not yet entirely sure if this will be just a flat uh, rate on your volume that you're trading. Or something that we could also do is we could even make it dependent on the trader surplus that we get um, for you. So we could actually look at what value do we provide for users? How much do we improve their limit price compared to well, what would they be maximally willing to pay? And then that is the, the real value that is added by the protocol. And we could just charge a percentage of that value added. Um, so these are kind of our two thought processes. But yeah, the, um, the solvers will be rewarded with um, basically with an equivalent of at least what they have to pay in gas on top of some kind of protocol fee for providing the service. Are they going to be also rewarded based off of like the effectiveness of their solution according to whatever metrics it is? And also, how are these metrics measured? Yeah, how, how do we make sure that people aren't just submitting bad solutions and they're getting like rewarded? Right. Uh, so there is a bunch of kind of soft criterions that the protocol can also enforce on a solution. And if, if you think about kind of the solvers in and of themselves, uh, to become a solver, you have to provide a bond to the protocol um, so that in case if you, if you misbehave, if you're, for example, censoring people's uh, orders or if you're maybe even just, well, submitting your solution, although you didn't provide the best objective criterion, if you're just basically not respecting the rules of the competition, then the protocol can slash you and there can be a penalty that can then be paid back to the users that um, took harm from this. But how do you detect that someone, like, is it an automated thing or is it like some sort of like governance-based thing? So at the moment, it's, uh, it's, it, solvers are kind of trusted by us. And so the code is, is, is written or reviewed by us. So we, we are just enforcing that, that no malicious behavior happens by kind of um, auditing the code. But um, of course, in the near future, we want to make this um, permissionless and just have Auditing anybody. the code. I mean, this is off chain, right? So you cannot actually see what code they're running. Right. I mean, it depends. If we are running the solvers, then we can look at. The, yeah. Sure. But in the in the ver like in the kind of our decentral our road to decentralization would be to have um, a protocol DAO enforce these slashing, well, these slashing events, but also enforce the the rules under which slashing can happen. And so one of the rules that this DAO might agree to enforce, for example, would be that no clearing price, um, even though if it maximizes trader surplus. Uh, may be away, may be off from, let's say, the most liquid on-chain liquidity source. Let's say Uniswap V3 ETH USDC is kind of your reference price for what's the price of Ether. And you could say, well, no, even if your solution is the best, you cannot submit a solution where your price, where your price is off the reference price by more than, let's say, 0.3% or 0.5%. Meaning that if you want to settle a trade that is far away from Uniswap's liquidity, you need to at least use as much liquidity from Uniswap to move that price onto the your target, well, basically onto that that bound in which you're kind of free to to diverge. And then of course, just by the sheer fact of having a competition, of having multiple solvers submitting solutions against one another, uh, if if another solver finds a, a better settlement, one that well gives more surplus to the traders, then that that solver is, is chosen to perform the, the settlement. Um, so that's another protection mechanism just by having this competition. Doesn't this just shift the MEV from the miner towards these solvers? Like, you know, now the solvers have the ability to extract MEV essentially because, you know, if they have the ability to censor transactions, for example, they can like move the slippage price, you know, the execution price to be wherever they want. And there's probably a lot of 
MEV to be extracted by doing this? So, so there's definitely a censoring problem. And so kind of another part of the decentralization is to have a data availability layer with consensus on which orders are part of a, um, of a batch at a, at a certain time. And so that the DAO can then also decide, well, this solver didn't use this specific order, although it would have improved the price and that user basically now has envy because, well, they had a better limit price. They would have liked to trade at the settle at the clearing price that was announced. Um, but envy freeness was not, was not guaranteed. Um, and just like a kind of hacky way of achieving this um, data availability for us would be to lose like a, to use like a, either a test network or a low um, fee kind of side chain uh, to, to kind of broadcast these orders at the same time. But of course, eventually, um, we could also have the DAO run kind of a gossip network and kind of get to consensus which orders form a batch at any, any, any given time. At that point, why not just build a new L2 for this? Sure. That So in, in a way, I mean, people were asking also if Gnosis Protocol isn't in some form an L2, uh, just because we have this off-chain order book and then we settle, like we do a transaction on-chain. We, we kind of don't really see it as an L2 because we are really tightly integrated with uh, layer one and every settlement moves funds from one account to one another and we're like directly using the liquidity of of layer one at least in this in this very first version um or in the second v2 but in this in the current version uh, we, we could envision a, a future in which we also have kind of a Merkle root of balances inside the protocol, and then it would probably become more of like a layer two uh, solution. And we're actively looking into how we can use liquidity on other layer twos and combine them and maybe become like a meta protocol to aggregate and get um, arbitrage freeness even across different L2 solutions. But yeah, that's a very technically challenging problem. We haven't found a, a great solution to that yet. How do you uh, sort of compare the, like, it, when it comes to this algorithm, like this coincidence of wants mechanism is only taking the, the flow at any given time without taking into account any of the like liquidity that exists into these pools. So, so, so for context, w w one of the things that so I'm working on a project called Osmosis and we're doing a lot of batching stuff as well. Uh, but, and so we actually have a very specific notion of like the goals of our, batching mechanism, which is to create fairness. And how we define fairness is if you take all the orders and randomize them infinite times, the execution price is the average of all of these like random permutations. This basically removes the MEV so that there's no ordering games that can be done because no matter what order, this is the most fair price possible. But to do this, we actually have to take into account the available liquidity in the pool. How would you compare this versus something more like what you guys are doing with coincidence of wants? I think I think what maybe the solution that you ex described solves kind of more practically is the is this this issue of um, compu computational feasibility of solving these kind of um, batch auction as a multidimensional order book, discrete order book with with multidimensional uniform clearing prices, which in itself is a very hard problem. Um, so like even harder than like NP complete and um, Definitely uh, very challenging to solve for a large amount of orders. That being said, kind of we are we have uh, pretty good algorithms that can that can find reason, good solutions or even like optimal solutions for still a reasonable amount of, of of problem sizes at least for Ethereum mainnet today. And kind of under that premise, to us it feels that having no ordering whatsoever, um, basically giving every trade within a block, within a batch, the exact same uniform clearing price is just the purest kind of mechanism or the, the fairest mechanism in itself. Um, but I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to also um, research the project that you mentioned a little bit more. It sounds like a very practical approach to kind of also get, um, yeah, basically order independent uh, execution prices. One of the reasons I like trading on an AMM instead of an order book, right, is when I'm in an order book, I always have this like notion of like, oh, am I getting screwed by being on this order book? You know, I why am I putting these market orders? I should be putting these limit orders instead. And like, you know, just all this mental overhead. And what's nice with an AMM is like market orders only. I submit it and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be getting a reasonably fair price. And the slippage bound is just this mechanism to like, you know, it's a fail safe mechanism where it's like, all right, if, if, if something's really out of whack, you know, have my slippage, like kill it. But with, he, with this model, it, it feels more like once again, like it's an order book where now 
I have to be very cognizant of the maximum best price I'm willing to accept because, you know, then you take that into account in your surplus calculations. And it's like, now I feel like I have to start gaming and thinking about like, okay, what should I put as the surplus? Should I overestimate my surplus just so I can get a better esti- uh, return for myself? And this just becomes a harder cognitive load for the users. Do you, have you run into this being an issue? Mm-hmm. I think w- one thing that maybe the the average user doesn't doesn't realize as such, and maybe also in the in the kind of purest form of how Uniswap should work, uh, sure they they are basically placing a market order, but under the hood, what they're actually doing with the slippage tolerance, they are in fact placing a limit order, and kind of with MEV geth uh, or, or with MEV and flashbots kind of rising, and just the the fact that miners are playing these games. At the end of the day, you are you are making a mistake today when you place an order directly on Uniswap with a large slippage tolerance because you are actually going to get your order filled exactly at your limit and not at a fair market price. And so that, that's kind of why, why, why we think, it, well, we, we, can, we can take the Uniswap trading experience where it feels like we give you a quote, this is your market order, you have somewhere in the settings a slippage criterion that maybe, I don't know, 5%, 10% of users understand what it actually means, and it feels like you're getting a fair market price. And we want to give the same experience to people on CowSwap, which is why we have kind of done the same the same user experience. And under the hood, just in the very basic case, and that's today is most of the cases, you will be the only person that is trading in a batch. And we will actually go and execute your batch against the best on-chain liquidity, um, when, which then kind of resolves back to uh, you having chosen to trade on Uniswap directly with this you know, market or fair, fair market order just with the difference that um, you go through the solver, which can actually protect you from MEV and which can actually, under the hood, make sure that while you personally are fine with a 0.5% slippage tolerance, the actual transactions that hits Ethereum just uses 0.1% or even 0% slippage tolerance uh, because it makes sure that the transaction is not front running, but not front running your, your intents. And then one other thing that we are working on, which of course is a, is a big endeavor, but uh, the best thing about a mechanism would be if it had like a true revelation principle where we could prove that it's the best strategy for all players to just give us their true willingness to pay and say, well, here's my limit price and there's no games to be played by over or under reporting your, your, um, your preference. Um, but yeah, that, that is ongoing research and ongoing work and, and something that the best mechanisms have. And we hope we can get to this um, also with by choosing the right objective criterion, by maybe doing some more simplifications to the mechanism, but fundamentally having batch auctions where true revelation is the optimal strategy. One, so there's a new version of CowSwap coming up where you're integrating a balancer. Can you explain a little bit, like, you know, what, what is the change that's coming up uh, and how is that balancer integration going to work? So basically the... Balancer version two uh, works with the concept of a of a vault, um, and so uh, you can you can trade just the old way that like you do at the moment also with Uniswap, where you um, basically take your balances that are in your wallet and you swap them for any other token. Um, but you also have kind of for more professional or more frequent traders the option to actually keep your balance inside the Balancer protocol and have the Balancer smart contract manage your wallets. ERC tokens for you. So it's basically just a matter of custody to do the tokens. Are they in the storage of your wallet or are they in the storage uh, of the balance of vault contract? But you can still, of course, use them as you please. And this concept of having these internal balances actually makes um, trading, at least for frequent users, significantly cheaper because they can save one entire ERC20 transfer, which costs a significant amount of gas depending on which ERC20 token you use. And so um, uh, yeah, Balancer version 2 will, for frequent traders, hopefully be uh, more gas efficient than, than traditional AN- AMMs. And then um, we basically uh, spoke with Balancer and we really liked their V2 uh, architecture and they really liked the idea of using coincidence of ones and giving better prices to the user. And um, well, basically we decided to do a partnership and integrate the Balancer Vault as a source for where your balance come f- can come from when you trade using Gnosis protocol. So they can, of course, still come from your wallet, from kind of any smart contract or your EOA, but they can now also come directly from the internal balance that you have inside um, the Balancer vault. And now if you use um, the Balancer AMMs through Gnosis protocol, 
that in itself will be even more gas efficient because we don't have to trade funds from the source wallet into our settlement contract, then perform the swaps and have to pay them back out. We can actually leave everything inside the balancer vault and perform the swaps directly just using balancer. And so all things equal, if balancer uh, has the comparable price than Uniswap, solving uh, your order via Gnosis protocol the uh, amount of gas that would be used should be less for balancer, and so they will have a structural advantage. Okay, so that that makes sense, right? So basically, what you have is like today, you know, a cow swap is is plugging into different liquidity sources, and that's still going to be the case in the future. It's going to be more gas efficient if you have your tokens already in balancer, and so then can save costs, and and I guess will be. Uh, also driving some liquidity there. I think it's tech- it's also more gas efficient if you're using external balances, just because um, balancer performs better for multiple swaps. Um, kind of if 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 you have to go from let's say BAL to WETH and then from WETH to GNO, um, that is more efficient inside the balancer vault because it just happens in one call. Um, and so also there, um, the tight integration that we have with the balancer vault will make these kind of swaps more gas efficient than using let's say Uniswap or Curve. One uh, question I had back about the MEV side was, so like, okay, so we have this like high amount of trust in the solvers to not do MEV. So, you know, I I spent a lot of time thinking about how to solve MEV on Ethereum as well. And the the challenge I kept running into was I can build a channel that's like very MEV resistant, which is kind of what you guys are doing with CowSwap. But if people can just bypass that channel and jump in front of, like, so what's to stop someone from, you know, looking at the giant batch trade that's happening on CowSwap or on Gnosis Protocol and seeing, hey, there's this front running opportunity. Let me just hit Uniswap or hit Balancer directly. Let me just front run the batch itself. So unless you have an AMM that only allows execution via CowSwap, how does that, did you actually solve anything from MEV? Just as a kind of side effect, like a side note, we are actually thinking about having some form of AMMs that are kind of not private, but that are kind of privileged uh, for Gnosis protocol. Um, But at the moment, this is not the case for sure. We are only hitting um, on-chain liquidity, which in that interaction by itself is front runnable, as you said. But um, there again, kind of the MEV protection in CowSwap is is twofold. Uh, The first protection comes from these coincidences of wants or this peer-to-peer matching where we trade one person directly uh, against one another. And there, the level of MEV protection is basically similar to when you have these um, zero X request for quote kind of orders when you do OTC trading, um, because the solver agrees on a price um, and the price doesn't depend on your ordering within the settlement. And then it just sends the amounts back and forth. Uh, and then it is that interaction in itself. It doesn't matter where it happens in the block. It is not front runnable. Um, so by creating more and more cows and getting people to actually use Gnosis protocol Together, uh, we can fight MEV kind of in a collaborative form. But then even for this access, and you're totally right, the, this interaction in itself is prone to front running. Um, however, there our idea is that uh, solvers are professional entities which can, for example, run MEV guests themselves and make sure that they submit their settlement in a bundle. And for example, even just take everyone that is not trading on Gnosis Protocol, let's say everyone that is still trading on SushiSwap or Uniswap, and they can arrange those trades in the perfect manner so that our settlement actually fits in kind of nicely and all the ones, well, basically that, that, that we use all the other um, liquidity to, to, to make our trade more profitable. Um, but even just in the base case, when you have a professional solver that says, I'm setting a very tight slippage on this interaction, um, it actually becomes very hard to to sandwich you um, if you're setting zero percent or zero point one percent slippage on your on your Uniswap interactions. It's still possible if your if the price moves extremely in your favor while your transaction is waiting to be mined, because then what was zero slippage at the time of submission becomes actually a significant slippage. But um, we are actually running continuous analysis of our uh, solver address, and except for one case where we basically introduced a bug and did a very bad trade ourselves, um, there has not been uh, any significant uh, sandwiching opportunity. I think the total sandwiching is a bit more than $1,000 on um, more than $100 million trading volume. So it seems to be working and and end users seem to be quite well protected from MEV, even if they are not trading in these coincidence of once. So I have two more questions about the algorithm. 
One is what do you do when, so let's say there's a more demand in one side. So there's a million dollars. I want to buy some asset and only 500 K that wants to sell it. The 500 K that ends up hitting the liquidity pool. Do you give an equal price to everyone in the cow that like participated in the cow? Exactly. So one of the, and it's theoretically something that we could even enforce on the smart contract layer um, that we say the, the price at which every single trade is settled is a uniform clearing price. There's just one price, no matter which which trade you are. Um, just the way this is just a technicality. At the moment, a malicious solver could submit a batch or could submit a solution where they actually give slightly different prices to different orders. But that would then, of course, also be a, a slashing criterion. And so, yes, um, we effectively give uh, everyone that submitted their order via CowSwap the same clearing price uh, if they're trading the same asset. And then the other one was one of the things that I remember you guys were very focused on, especially in the earlier version of the Gnosis protocol, was this idea of ring trades. And ring trades are, you know, they're like multidimensional cows, right? Like multidimensional coincidence of wants instead of just saying, hey, here's a bilateral one. Can we create like, you know, Someone wants to sell Bitcoin for ETH, someone wants to sell ETH for atoms, and someone wants to sell atoms for Bitcoin. There's no bilateral consensus of wants, but if you take all three together, you have a cow. Is that something that the cow swap handles right now? It, it does. Um, and it was actually a, a relatively big design decision at the beginning. We were thinking about starting easy, just building kind of a giving people Uniswap, but better prices. This was kind of one of our first ideas, but just, you know, we'll always route to Uniswap, but if we have a coincidence of ones, we'll just take that. Um, but then we did some analysis and we actually found that the amount of potential coincidence of ones um, we can find by looking at not just the direct, you know, buy and sell token that people um, send, but actually by dissecting their trades into this, you know, little sub hops. So for example, if you're trading curve for you for USDC today, you will go via WETH in the middle. So you'll actually do two hops. And by dissecting all the trades that happen in a just a random block today into their, you know, atomic paths, we are actually able to uh, generate a much more like a significant larger share of coincidence of once and so make the protocol much more useful. And that's why we decided to actually go this route of multidimensionality and say, um, well, we can yeah trade any token for any other token in the same batch and then make sure that we model them in kind of a graph or kind of a multi-dimensional order book, if you wish, and and make use of these rings if they happen. And, and one classic example for this would be stable coins, where we have a highly fragmented market uh, of like 10 or 15 tokens that all represent the US dollar. And so uh, there might always be very liquid liquidity between each stable token pair, but then you might be willing to buy your project token with uh, USDT and I might be willing to sell my project token for USDC. And then we can actually form a ring by using that, let's say, curve liquidity that connects USDC and USDT quite quite efficiently. Yeah, one thing that would be really nice is like, you know, on a lot of DEX aggregators, I wish they had an option to let me choose. Like, you know, I don't really care whether I'm I'm trying to sell something. I don't care whether I'm getting USDC or USDT. I'm just like, give me whichever one has a better price. And that would be like a sort of a nice feature that like, I guess you're saying is that it's somehow somewhat built in already into uh, cow swap, which is cool. Right. That is actually another uh, kind of an idea that we had very early on, and it's far from being implemented, but the um, the concept of kind of um, giving a bit more specialized preferences uh, of what you would like to receive. And and one extreme case of this would be basket orders, where you say, look, here's a here's a bag of tokens I have, and here's like a bag of tokens that I want. Um, and then, you know, I don't really care what gets traded for what, or but just, you know, at the end of the day, I would like to change my position that I have today into some target position. And um, yeah, just the idea of having more expressiveness in your orders is something that we would also like in the future to bring to, to Ethereum. Wouldn't this massively decrease the uh, returns for LPs? Because like, you know, LPs are sort of very heavily dependent on fees to, you know, subsidize their IL. But now if you're trying to start to match things against each other, the LPs are not really earning and you're, and you're not giving the fees to the LPs. Isn't this like, is this almost like potentially existential to like the sustainability of a lot of these AMMs? And, and to a way, you know, on top of that, it's like, I, I feel like there's this notion where, yes, it's the LPs are not being executed anymore. So maybe they, sh isn't it kind of weird to give them fees if they're not being executed against? 
But I think the existence of the LPs is what's enabling this trading to even happen. Like the fact that you're able to find these coincidence of wants, the only reason people are trading right now on these DEXs on chain is because they know that those liquidity providers are there as a backstop. And so isn't it fair to somehow still give them some sort of fees to like compensate them? Yes. Uh, so uh, maybe, I mean, maybe, maybe we can start by just saying like, who are the winners and who are the losers in this model um, in a way? So there are some, some, some people that profit from this protocol and some people that should not profit. And uh, kind of the, the people that we would like to see profit are the actual traders, the retail traders that are just wanting to swap tokens for one another and today pay significant fees to liquidity providers or then even arbitrageurs or front runners or um, basically yeah, people, miners that uh, eventually extract them. And so on the losing side, well, we have arbitrageurs. Um, if, if we actually get the majority of um, people trading on Gnosis protocol, given that there's no at least risk-free arbitrage within a single block, because every every trade gets kind of the same uniform clearing price, uh, we will take hopefully a lot of kind of the value that is extracted today from arbitrageurs or provided to make the market more efficient, if, depending on which side you take, uh, and pay that back to, to, to retail traders. The other part, of course, is liquidity providers on, on AMMs today. And potentially, there, well, there is a chance that, that there will be a significant cut to, to, to their um, trading volume. However, uh, I think at least for now in the foreseeable futures, Gnosis Protocol in itself relies heavily on the liquidity that is being provided um, by these AMMs. And so by making trading on Ethereum more fair and actually more accessible to retail users, you could also argue that, you know, in a way, I mean, most of the time we will trade against the best on-chain liquidity source just because coincidence of wants, while they exist, they are still not the majority of kind of yeah. trades that, that happen on-chain. On um, and then the other kind of counter argument maybe against that is that at least with Unis Uniswap v3, you could argue that that even today you can see there's there's I think one address last week that has been called out for adding liquidity just at the current market price when it makes sense when they see a lot of volume being traded in the order book, um, then they add very very concentrated liquidity just at that specific market price to basically capture most of the fee and. That also goes uh, at the expense of kind of the normal passive Uniswap liquidity provider that just has a high range that they passively provide liquidity to. And there you could say, well, if this exists via MEV Geth, then it's, it's kind of a sign that there is kind of this, there is this effective way of matching people directly against, pass, against active ma market makers on chain via a more effective mechanism than, you know, trying to sandwich, uh, adding liquidity, removing liquidity in between some trades. And so we hope with Gnosis Protocol V2, we can actually be that layer. Um, and well, if this kind of, you know, if there's people that want to take the opportunity and, and, and reduce the amount of trading that, or the amount of fees that get paid to these large scale, uh, passive liquidity providers, then that would happen uh, regardless of Gnosis protocol V2 or not. And, and we are just hopefully the most effective way to match active market makers and retail traders on chain. So what, where is CowSwap today and like what's the what's the roadmap ahead? Yeah, so uh, today we uh, have kind of we have three main liquidity sources integrated natively into our kind of batch enabled algorithm that can find coincidence of ones, which are Uniswap version 2, uh, SushiSwap and we are very close to finalizing our balancer integration. And uh, so, well, that is kind of the, the base liquidity that we have um, in our own native solver. But of course, we see with kind of the rise of um, other liquidity, like Uniswap v3 launched recently, and there's other protocols coming up, we kind of uh, need a more diversified landscape for solving. And it, some, you know, it takes us more time to integrate new liquidity sources than it takes uh, new projects to provide protocols. And so one of the things that we've been done recent that we've been doing recently was to also integrate DEX aggregators into our solver landscape. And so kind of as a fallback or as kind of another way to solve instances, we now um, use one inch Paraswap and Matcha to just check what is the best way of, of solving our trades individually in case there's no cow, there's no coincidence of ones. What would be the best trade, best, best pass to match them on chain? Um, and so, well, even if there's a cow, but, you know, just other protocols have a much better price, then our ranking ensures that each order is actually traded at the, at the best possible path. 
And so what this leads to CowSwap um, also being, at least at the moment, is kind of a meta DEX aggregator where you can place your order and uh, you can place it you know, at some point in time. Let's say you're a multi-sig or a DAO, you could even place your order a couple of, you know, it could take, it could take you potentially hours from initiating your order to collecting all the signature or completing the vote to actually submit your order. And then the best route that gets taken on chain, if you're using Paraswap or if you're using UniV3 or Balancer, that can then be decided by our solver infrastructure. And so, um, yeah, CowSwap is, well, CowSwap, and it can trade uh, peer-to-peer and match your coincidence of ones, but it's also, in a way, a metadex aggregator that makes sure that um, between one-inch Paraswap matcha, whatever other sources we might integrate in the future, you always get the best price at execution time. Do you think that uh, aggregators will try to build their own in-house versions of this? So I'm thinking about, like, for example, one inch, right? Like, or I feel like DEX aggregators are this like very hard to defend business model, right? Where like it's it's very hard to find a moat, and I th- and so you know I think that one inch tried to do this via their Mooney swap product. And, you know, they're like, all right, can we like build a lot of liquidity in house? And that will be like one of our moats. And it turned out that didn't work. But it seems like building their own cow mechanism would be a very powerful way for them to like, you know, they have all this order flow already and to build a moat using their order flow. How are you guys incentivizing these aggregators to like be part of Gnosis protocol rather than build their own in-house versions. Right. Maybe uh, one, one thing to, to start off, um, we, it is actually not trivial to be a DEX aggregator. First of all, um, modeling all the liquidity that there is, catching up with like all the protocols, and then even just solving a single order optimally is not, it, it's it's a solvable problem, but not a trivial problem. So uh, being a DEX aggregator is definitely not not a trivial task, as, as we also learned and and just trying with our kind of cow-enabled, uh, more advanced mechanism. But that being said, we would, of course, m- very much like OneInch or Paraswap or any other team that already has some expertise in this field to provide solutions to Gnosis Protocol. And um, the fact that the protocol in itself enables, hopefully soon, permissionless solvers. But for now, I mean, for now, we kind of, the Gnosis DAO actually um, whitelists the, the, the available solvers. We we can we can integrate a, a one inch uh, version that can settle multiple or a paraswap version that settles multiple trades at the same time and tries to find cows within them, um, and that would be wonderful. That would be great, and we would love to work together with uh, strong teams in the field to make sure we have this active competition. And well, the reward would be coming um, from the protocol fee that is that is hope that would be that would be earned. And the reason why teams should be doing it is that, as you said, it's 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 very important to get this order flow. And in order to really maximize the value of the user, we need to get a significant chunk of uh, order flow from Ethereum routed through this protocol so that we can actually maximize the um, amount of cows and the amount of value. Um, and so we think that by just providing this base layer protocol and then incentivizing um, parties around it, that can actually be beneficial. It's a win-win situation for for protocols as well, uh, rather than trying to build their own, um, yeah, just in-house in-house matching just on their own order flow. So z- zooming out maybe a little bit before we wrap up. So the the entire space of AMMs and like on-chain decentralized exchanges has like, exploded. You know, not long ago, there was like, you know, Ether Delta, which was this order ba- order book based exchange on Ethereum that, you know, was had terrible user experience that didn't really have volume. And, you know, it was almost sort of like looked at, oh, well, these, these AMMs, they or decentralized exchanges are like far away, can't really compete with centralized exchanges. Well, then Uniswap and others came and had like tremendous success. And now we are seeing like, you know, an explosion of different things. So, so two questions on that. First of all, with regards to order book based exchanges versus AMMs, I know there is, for example, also the FTX and Serum team, right, where they're building this order book based exchange on Solana, and there was also Binance Chain building an order book based exchange on on Binance Chains, and both of those uh, teams basically argued that. Well, the reason why uh, order book based exchanges aren't like working on Ethereum is because, you know, transactions are too expensive, blocks are too slow. 
but you know, really, it's a superior design to AMMs. And you know, once these technical issues are sort of resolved, then like you know, that will prevail. Like, what's your stance on that? Do you agree, or like, what do you think is the future of all the book based exchanges? Yeah, it's it's definitely a very interesting question, and also a question where we where our opinions differ. I would say within the team, we're not we're not at all sure how it will play out. What I think what we what we might see in the near term is more expressive AMMs and kind of where it's not just uh, x times y equals k, but um, well, I mean, curve has started to go a little bit in that direction, balancer as well. But just having people express their preference curves as functions is definitely an innovation that has aided passive liquidity providers to play a, a, a game and to, to play to take part in this game and to provide liquidity on Ethereum. So I don't think we will see this go away in the in the near future. To the question whether fundamentally order books are uh, more effective, I would say probably yes. And this is kind of also why we are working very hard to prove that point and to try to show that, well, we can maybe eventually get even some active market makers to provide liquidity off chain on Gnosis protocol to even further remove the necessi necessity to go to um, on chain protocols. Um, and so basically create some more cows, even if, if they're somewhat artificial. But yeah, I, I'm, I mean, it's, it's definitely, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting space. And uh, we, we kind of try to take an agnostic approach to it. And especially with Gnosis protocol being able to tap into all on chain liquidity, we kind of want to stay away from the the protocol, the, the AMM innovation space and just say, you know, whatever is the newest and latest and greatest protocol on chain, we will just integrate it and we are happy to, to take whatever um, people come up with and, um, and just amend it with coincidence of once and batch auctions and try to make, give the user the best price at the end of the day. I think it'll be really interesting to see how that works out because, you know, I, I, I think with osmosis, we have a slightly different thesis where we think that like MEV reduction and AMM design are like, and like the protocol design are like so intertwined that it is a little bit hard to disentangle them. And it's hard, like, you know, you can build the best MEV reduction system when you have control over the AMMs themselves. But um, I, I think it's really interesting to see how, how the like sort of approaches will sort of differ. Mm -hmm. And like, and, and I, I think there's value in providing what's like, you know, if there is already so much liquidity that exists on like a lot of these Ethereum decks. And so what's the best MEV reduction that we could provide on top of them? There's also one other aspect about AMMs that we think is, is really interesting and that kind of plays out maybe between Uniswap v3 and Balancer v2 at the moment, which is kind of cooperative liquidity provision where there's competitive liquidity provision. And yeah, so on Balancer v2, you're still joining a pool. Everyone in the pool gets the same amount of fees. And uh, even though you can, like there's maybe an oracle that decides what is the current best fee to be chosen, it is still kind of you're all in it together. You have like a cooperative approach to things. Whereas in Uniswap v3, you now have these independent independent kind of, um, well, liquidity management strategies, and it becomes a bit of more of a competition, like is your strategy better than mine or is mine better than yours? And we kind of, we kind of would like to um, take this cooperative approach and kind of apply it to traders uh, instead of liquidity providers and basically say, well, if you go on CowSwap, you're putting, you, you, you're cooperating with other traders, you're coming together to this marketplace where we act in your best interest, where we try to match you peer to peer if we can. And if we can't, then we will give you the best on chain price that, that we can find otherwise. So we want to get this cooperative kind of mindset um, to, to, to retail trading as well. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks so much, Felix, for joining us. It was really cool to hear about CowSwap and to, uh, you know, sort of see where the protocol is going to go. So thanks so much. Thank you for having me. It was great. Great to talk to you guys. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>